Okay. Shalom, everybody. So I wonder how many people in the room need for me to introduce myself. <laughs> there are quite a few. Okay, so bear with them and me, all the others. Here is the nutshell Rachel Korazim introduction. I was born. I went to school, some more school, got married, had kids, they went to school, some more school. I'm now at the phase where the grandchildren are getting ready for the some more school. <laughs> of whom I have eight, but only just one is getting ready for the some more school now. All the others are smaller. In all that time I had worked in Jewish education, most of the time, although living in Israel, working with Jewish educational frameworks outside of Israel. I'm using that convoluted sentence in order to indicate that it was day schools, con uh, congregational schools, adult education, summer camping, JCCs, synagogues, what did I forget? Whatever. And in all that time, I have dealt with two major topics in Jewish education. How to teach about Israel, how to teach about the Holocaust. We're gonna do mainly Israel but there'll be a connection to the Holocaust. Since many people do that, I'm not alone, you're in Hartman, you know how many people do that. I needed to develop a niche for myself. That wasn't a bad thing to do because I love that niche. I'm not alone there, by the way, but I'm very comfortable. And that niche is looking at these issues through modern Israeli literature. So when you do in many other Hartman sessions, looking at older Jewish texts, I took upon myself to remind you that Jewish literacy did not stop at the Middle Ages. Neither did it stop with Heschel. It's being written every day right as we talk, and some of the people that write it are not even observant. And yet they are part of that huge library that we call the Jewish library. This is what I do. Is there anything very urgent that any of the new people absolutely need to know about me? And think about that question and its urgency the following way. Rachel, if I knew that about you, that would make my time with you much more meaningful. Or the flip side, Rachel, if I do not know that about you, I really don't care about what you have to say. <laughs> so what is it that you urgently need to know about me? Ask and I'll let you know. I'm an Israeli. I don't want to address something. I'll let you know that as well. Nothing. You're fine. Yalla. Let's go. Okay. So this is the moment to say shalom for all those who do not need for me to introduce myself. All over the place. I'm not going to name temples because then I'll insult somebody who will remain unnamed. So zehu. Yalla. Off we go. It's building character and building a society. By the way, a sort of logistics remark, because me stepping in, for, and I'm not Gideon Saar, I know you need to be told that, okay. So because of me stepping in, some of you who had left your hotel rooms or other rooms this morning and did not have my text with them, and now need text, can I see a show of hands? Okay, guys, will you bring them over? because they, they, we were thinking about that, and they were gracious enough to prepare some more text, and here is this gentleman now handing them out to you, so you do not feel without chas v'chalila, God forbid, we all have text. You do. Um, for the new people, I could many, many times in the world of the life, but I, I do think it's more, a little don't tell me a big story because I need every minute of this session. I have no connection with Auschwitz. That will come up. Don't worry. That will come up. Okay. Thank God nobody in Auschwitz in my family. Okay? But thank you. So, it's that big moment and I know, don't know how well I need to keep the secret that I have my sources to know what the topic of Hartman for the summer will be, normally way before others. And I'm not revealing my sources, but I get to hear that about January, January, February. 
And then they come up with the topic, and then there is this time for me to figure out, so which way do I go in order to learn from modern Israeli literature, not always from observant people, about the topic of the year? And this year, the topic being Derech Eretz, and the elaborate subtitle being Derech Eretz, Building Character and Building Society. I was starting to look at Israeli poetry and how it draws from two different sources to tell the Israeli or the Israeli to be how they should be and to tell Israeli society how it should be. And from the many sources that modern Israeli writers draw from, I have decided to focus on two. What are the messages that we are learning from Sinai, namely from Torah? What are the messages that we are learning from Auschwitz? It, this being my seventh year with Hartman, and seventh has a meaning in Jewish life, I figured it's also my time to pay some homage to the place. And those of you who know about the writings of the late Rabbi uh, David Hartman will know that one of his milestone articles for Israeli society was about Auschwitz or Sinai. And looking at the society that he encountered when we came that was totally Auschwitz focused and he needed Israelis to look at Sinai as well. Auschwitz does not justify everything that we are all about. So this is also by including these two words, Sinai and Auschwitz, it's also sending you back to Google that classical David Hartman article and read it about Auschwitz and Sinai. It's available in English and Hebrew, whatever is easier for all of you. So this is a subtle tone. How shall we go about it? I want you to start with a non-verbal text. This is a caricature on the left-hand side. Can you all see it? Can you all see it? On the left-hand side of my slide, you have a figure of a person. This person has a name. He is called Srolik. That was the image of the young state of Israel that a caricature artist, obviously from Hungary, where else would they come from? For those who do not yet know, I'm from Hungarian descent. Told you that my history will come into it. Katriel Gardosh, other one known in Israel as Dosh, long dead, created this little figure, Srolik, who will go through all the wars and tribulations in everyday life in Israel. And through what happens to him, we will learn more about ourselves. This is a reflection of Israeli society in those 50s and 60s and 70s until he was gone. Dosh obviously was a Holocaust survivor. And at one occasion, he needed to address himself to where is Israel as per. So Srolik is your young Israeli with the Kova Tembel being able to climb a tree, and then both his hands are leaning on two branches. His right hand to us is touching that branch that looks like a weeping willow. And the tear-like leaves fall on that part of the tree that is no more, while the other hand is leaning on the other branch that is flourishing like the emblem of the state of Israel, the menorah. And, okay, so talk about educating a society just in that one picture. By the way, for those who do not know me yet, all the others can tell you, my PowerPoint presentations are freely available to everybody. Write to me and you will get one. So don't bother about taking pictures of whatever. I'll email it to you as soon as I'm done with the lecture, okay? And my email is the easiest, last name, Korzim at gmail.com. That's it. So here is that image that we are looking at, and now there is the Tanakh on the other side, and how is the young state of Israel going to draw from that? So there'll be that source, 
of you know the, the platform at Auschwitz. Also, by the way, picture taken when the Hungarian countryside Jews are getting there, the only day that pictures were taken at the platform in Auschwitz. We will start with a general message for which I'm calling upon you, now that you have the text, to look at the first poem that you have. Uh, I was told that the color was light blue. I hope, you, I trust you all found it. And we have an Amichai. We will be doing the reading in English, but I have destroyed so many forests in the Amazon or whatever because I want you to have the Hebrew original as well. And today we will be looking just at one expression in the Hebrew, but I need for you to be able to see that also for my ultimate goal in Jewish education, and that is to make you feel guilty for not having Hebrew and seeing how much is lost in translation. Okay, so that's like a major goal in my life because I'm a Jewish educator. I need to make you feel guilty. I you all know how it works. Look at this one sentence and the picture I have put next to it, which is a classical Jewish agency poster from pre-state years. And it goes, you must show weakness and you've got to have a ten. Oi, the Hebrew, asur leharot chulsha v'tzarich liyot shazuf. Remember Amichai, born in Germany to an Orthodox family, making Ali, born in 24, making Aliyah in 1936 when he's barely 12, and probably a nice yeke kid, all pale and polite, and dressed in those clothing from Germany, and all the other kids making fun of him for that, because why shouldn't you make fun of a new immigrant? It's a big mitzvah in this country, where we love Aliyah, it's only the olim that we cannot stand. <laughs> and that message that he carries in his heart all these years, and will only transpire into one of his last books, Open, Shut, Open, the very last, 1995, you have, by, by the way, there are two possible of translations into English. Some of them go open, close, open, and some of them open, shut, open. It's still the same book. Okay? So in that book, you will find that poem, you mustn't show weakness and you've got to have tan. Where did we, he learn it? In school? Later, maybe, in the Palmach? that you want to be a character, an Israeli? Well, let me tell you how it works. You have to have a suntan, and you will never show weakness or emotions. Talking about building an Israeli character, the derech eretz. But when you go to the text in your binders, this is a classical Amichai shift. Only normally in an Amichai poem, you will have like, God have mercy over school children, la 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 la. And then there is all this separation from God in that early poem from his first book. This is from his last. And then he comes to the middle of the poem and he will say, ve'olai, perhaps, maybe. And there'll be a change. In this poem, the mature Amichai is already allowing himself the counter message. This is how you raised me in this country. This is what I was taught to become, but let me tell you. And look at the next line and weep. Because the next line says, but sometimes I feel like the thin veils of Jewish women who faint at weddings and on Yom Kippur. Can you at all even fathom having an Israeli who feels like fainting at the wedding or at Yom Kippur services, like it's totally anti-Israeli. And you will not find it in early Amichai. You'll have to go to the last years when he's already an established poet and he will tell you, you know what guys, it's time I told you. Deep inside, there is that little kid from the synagogue in Germany, just like in the Maurizio Gottlieb painting, and don't even look at the forefront where the men are. Look at the back because he takes even further step back. 
Not only is he like those Galuti diaspora exiled Jews who faint at weddings and on Yom Kippur services, he's like the women, like a step back further to the Azarat Nashim. Wow, Amicha, you know the one who fought in the Negev? He is like that? You mustn't show weakness, and you've got to make a list of all the things you can load in a baby carriage without a baby. And you could start crying. Because this is your palmachnik. And what is the metaphor? What do you need to be ready to be able to be as an Israeli? To save yourself like a Holocaust person. Make the list of what will you carry when the day comes. Can you see how towards the end of his days, there is not a building confidence that this is permanent, but rather a going back to an earlier existence, say we need to learn from that as well. We need to be ready for that as well. Even as we go, 1995 is the last book. My goodness, Israel is like here. And it won the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War and the La you know we have done it. And Amichai said, uh uh. Learn from them. Make the list of the stuff you can easily carry. This is the way things are, things stand now. If I pull out the stopper after pampering myself in the bath. I'm afraid that all of Jerusalem and with it the whole world will drain into the huge darkness. Oi, those, those magical fears that we sometimes have, that everything around us that looks so permanent and, and forever and safe could disappear in no time. And we all know how fragile life can be and how little it takes for the things you totally trust and rely on to disappear. And the aging Amichai wants the Israeli society to include that as well. In the daytime, I lay traps for my memories, and at night, I work in the Bil'an mills, turning curse into blessing and blessing into curse. Permanently in Israel, be a Bil'am. So we learned from the Holocaust, we are going to Torah. I learned from those lists that you had for the carriages of the babies without the babies in them, and now I'm going to Bilam. And there was a trick there that I need to continue working. Look at the bad things, make them good. Look at the good things, see how, God forbid, they might change. The, this whole image, the metaphor, and always people will ask me, Rachel, do Israelis pick up that? Do they know what the Bil'an mills will be? And I have one way of checking, my grandchildren. Because they study Tanakh in school and they don't go to Orthodox schools. And so I will ask them and say, yeah, Bil'am, the guy who wanted to curse, yeah, sure they know. So Amichai, like many an Israeli poet, here's a classical Rachel Korazim cliche, you need to hear it again if you heard it. Fluency in biblical text in Israel has nothing to do with your level of observance. In Israel, we study Tanakh in your regular non-observant schools. And we study it as text, we study it as history, which is not 100% kosher to study it as history, but who cares? This is our story, and we know it. So he works at the Bilam factory. And don't ever show weakness. Sometimes I come crashing down inside myself without anyone noticing. I'm like an ambulance on two legs holding the patient inside me to the last aid, and this is when I'm calling upon you to go to the Hebrew text. So go to the page of the Hebrew text, and look up this line, the third from the bottom, and look at the trick that the Hebrew can do. First of all, let's explore the English, because it's good as well. We normally, when we want to be effective, we will take people to first aid, not to last aid. Amichai is playing around with our classical everyday notion. And this is actually the translator, Hannah Bloch, a poet by her own right of blessed memory from Berkeley, California, if you happen to be from those parts. 
and she, she had the touch of magic here by using the, the last aid instead of first aid, because what Amichai says in that last line, I hope you can follow the Hebrew, umetaltel betochi et hamemutat, I am carrying the one who fell apart, el lo ezra, to no help. But look at how the switch of letters, el, which means towards, but also God, and lo, which is the negation, are the same letters as they cross each other. So had we studied this in Hebrew, we would be able to totally go into that which I want to show you about this first poem. And the model for my whole presentation is the see-so movement. This source of how to be as opposed to the other source of how to be. This source tell telling you one thing, the other source telling you another. Are you with me? Is that OK? All right. This was not a serious study of Amichai's poem. We will come back to it in other sessions in the future. Trust me. OK. Let us continue with our PowerPoint. So they'll be learning from Auschwitz. And I would give you all those pictures of how nowadays we have made this building character, building society of learning from Auschwitz into a totally structured thing, both you and us. It's almost a rite of passage. You grow up in the Jewish world, Israel or North America, we schlep you to Auschwitz, okay? We do that. Actually, shall I ask for a show of hands how many of you have supported that with your money? How many of your kids went? You know, it's a thing we do. We have come by the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, to a point when we think that our derech eretz, our conduct, our building character has something to do with that place. So I want to show you what happened in the earlier years, before we had all those trips going to Poland, before it had become all structured, because we have actually conflicting messages coming from that background, and I would love to show them to you. So how will we work it? We will be looking at a poet called Ulrich Grimberg. Uh, how many people here in the room think they know me, sort of, are comfortable with me? At least half of you should be surprised that I'm teaching in Ulrich Grimberg, because you can re not recall one session in all the years that you know me that I taught you in Ulrich Grimberg, because like everything else in Israel, poetry too is political. And I belong to a certain side of the Israeli political continuum, and I hope you're not in shock to learn that it's slightly left of the center. And Ulrich Grimberg is totally the other side. Although he too started in the socialist camp, but I will want to learn a very important message from Ulrich Grimberg. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that forced me to go that way and move out of my comfort zone by going to these voices. And after him, Gil Nativ, which is a friend, a well less known poet. Then we'll go, obviously, you have to go when you come with me to Nathan Alterman, Chaim Guri, and Michal Gorin. Now, what I'd like you to do is to understand that my teaching of learning from Auschwitz will go in the system of a teacher and his student. So in our case, Ulrich Grimberg, the first couple, is the teacher, Gil Nativ, coming in 30 years later with his poetry, is the student of the same message. And with Alterman, I would say Guri, not student, understudy. And then a much, much, much younger poet, also connected to Hartman, Michal Govrin, like 40, 50 years later. But we are looking at teaching and learning of the same lesson because we are into how you build a character. So we'll be looking at Ulrich V. Grimberg. You can see the years gone for quite a number of years. And his student, Gil Nativ, still with us. Normally, we can see him at Hartman with the rabbis, but unfortunately not this year. Then you'll have Alterman with Guri, the understudy, just passed away a few months ago this year. 
and then you will have Michal Gouvrin. So you'll have the two students who are still with us and all those older teachers of the Derech Eretz. When we will come to learning from Tanakh, we will have a different system, and I'm not going into detail right now. Oritz Greenberg. A poet who started, you can look at the years, and you can see, and I opted to show you not a photography of his portrait, but rather a beautiful portrait by Ruven Rubin, because I think that suggests the place of Oritz Greenberg in Israel and in the culture. So he starts off as a new Ole in the 30s, coming from Poland with a solid Yiddish poetry background. He will belong to the socialist camp. Bel Katzen Nelson was his friend. Ben-Gurion admired him like totally. And then at a certain point when he feels that Haganah is not doing enough against the Brits, I have to, in every lecture, at least one time I need a foul word, so you'll have to excuse me. He gets totally pissed off and moves to the other camp, to the Jabotinsky camp, who is way, and he becomes their prophet. Now, I want to show you something interesting that I hope you will like, because those of you who studied many a time with me know how oftentimes I will show you Alterman from the newspaper. And so I want to show you that Oritz V. Greenberg also gets to his audience through the daily newspaper. And it's such a local Israeli thing that our major poets publish in the daily newspaper, and their readership will be waiting for their poems as the message of the day. And here I need for you to see the date. So I highlighted, I know it's not big enough. So here it is. Cherut, that's the daily paper of the Jabotinsky group, the Ben-Gurion, the like, Begin group, as opposed to Davar being the daily paper of the left of center side. And the date is Yom Vav, Tetvav Kislev Tavshin Tet, 17th of December 1949. I know that it looks like eight, but because it says Tavshin Tet, and I know that 48 is Tavshin Chet, so Tavshin Tet needs to be a nine. It's just blurred there, okay? Pardon? No, 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 no. No, I checked. I double checked. Okay. It's December. And now this is important for us to note, because this is how, how old is the state of Israel? year plus. How long since the end of World War II? Three years? Okay. Now you need to know this about Oritz V. Grimberg. Here's a book, Bemamlechet Hatzlav. Anybody can ye read Yiddish? Not one? In Malchus von Salem. In the kingdom of the image of the wrong guy, you know, the Tselem, that's what we are not supposed to have, okay? So it's in the country of the cross, of the Tselem, of the, the image of that forbidden thing. And it's in 1923, and it is not a text that you have, we are not studying it. I need you to bear the date in your mind and look at what he's writing. Anybody is willing to read who has a strong voice and can read this? 1923. Anybody is willing to read aloud nicely? Not one? You need my accent, will you? Okay, go. Yet I speak to you of prophecy, the black prophecy. From our valleys, a pillar of cloud will rise. From our dark breath and bitter cries of pain. Yet you will not perceive the horror in your bodies. The chatter will continue from your burning palace. Jews, Jews, as twice and yet begins to seep into the palaces, and suddenly the icons scream in Yiddish, no one is left standing. Shepherds lie stiff by trees, and rainbow colors blaze their eyes. The stables burn, the sheep bleat madly, it blazes higher. From all sides, people carry wood to the fire, a little 
silver cross plays fire. Can you believe it? 1921? Like Hitler did not rise to power yet? So in Israeli culture, in those who admire Oris V. Grimberg and those who, because of the politics, less so, nobody will negate the fact that if there was a prophet of the Holocaust in our midst, it was Oris V. Grimberg. He had these visions, and he publishes it. In the kingdom of the cross, he calls it. It's Europe, he knows. It will, he's still in Europe when he writes this. Like, totally unbelievable. And then years go by, and Uritzvi Grimberg, you will find him, I don't know if you have page numbers. You do? Okay, so learning from Auschwitz, Kodesh HaKodeshim. Wow, it's a tough one. It's a conversation between a mother and a son. He writes it in the first person. The year is 1949. Israel is barely born, and he feels the need to send the message of how we need to be because of the message from Auschwitz, okay? At the last moment, when the eyes burst out and the blood started flowing, and the body had dropped, dropped into my arms. Now, we could spend an hour on this because there is a total visualization of that horrible moment of death, probably by Gath, as the hour's eyes pop out. He was not there. He was already here. His mother was there. And the whole and the rest of the family. And the whole poem talks to you about lesson learned, if because of one reason is the sense of guilt of those who came in time, who were not followed by family members, who did not rush back to help, who were standing idly from afar, not only non-Jews, Jews alike here in Israel. So the images, I'm in Israel, she's there in Belzitz, which is where she died, and he has an image, he can see her dying and falling into his arms when he is in Eretz Israel, and she's there, and probably there was nobody to bury, just ashes. But in his mind, he is holding the dead body of his mother that he rushed in time to hold as it was falling apart in Belzitz. Because I appeared there, oh my goodness. He needs to tell himself to visualize that. We were there, we, we, we came back. We wanted to help you at the site of killing. And I had said full of pity, mother, mother. By the way, there is no official translation of this. This is a homemade Rachel Korozim translation. I call upon you as always. If you have better ideas, Please correct. This is the first time I'm teaching this. Because the Hebrew says, imi, imi, which is the way to call your mother in Hebrew. But I thought the English would better translate like mom, mom, or mother, mother. Okay? She raised her head and placed it on my shoulder and said, my son, my son, bni, bni. She forgot it was Belzitz, the altar, one of the death camps. And I said, yes, mother, yes, your son. Did you know, my son, the going are killing me? I know, mother. Blessed are you. my God, my son is alive. So look at this, at this tension. First of all, the imagined quest. They would have wanted to know whether we knew. This is what she would be curious about as she was dying. So I need to tell her even posthumously, yes, mom, we knew, and they'd come, okay? Yes, we knew the goy were killing you. 
And then the voice from the other side that he recognizes as a true son, thank God you were saved. Thank God you left in time. I'm going to die, but my son, he is alive. The wind had carried us, my mother in my arms, and the wind placed us at the entrance of a forest with the stream at our feet. Did you bring us to Lebanon, my son? To Lebanon, mother. Blessed are you, my God. I can smell the scent of Lebanon. Now look. First of all, when you read the biography of uh, Oritz Grimberg and his family, you will learn that his mother, as a young woman, loved to bathe in the river in their shtetl. Okay? But also note what character he gives his mother. Her image of the land of Israel is the image of the Song of Songs, of Shira Shirim, Itim Ilvanan. We are learning from Belzets. We are learning from the Holocaust. But the character relies on biblical images of her understanding of Eretz Israel. She doesn't have the Eretz Israel of Oris Grimberg who lives here. She has the imaginary Eretz Israel, and that's a biblical image. Lebanon. Aha, I hear splashing water, my son. Indeed, water, mother, have you placed the Jordan at my feet? Total biblical imagery. My son, the Jordan, my mother. Take me to the Jordan, my son. Let, us pure, uh, let its purifying waters pass over me. I will take you to the Jordan, mother. The cool water will heal me, my son. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. And now when you go to the Hebrew text, you will see how in the shape of a litany this is. In the shape almost of a piyut, of this conversation, posthumous conversation between mother and son. And therefore the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh is in, in introduced. Thank you, God. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. When I was a young girl, my son splashing in the river during Tammuz evenings, by the way, now we are in Tammuz, okay? Tammuz evenings. So again, this is a mother that will not say June. The way she was raised, she will say Tammuz, because that's a Hebrew month, okay? Splashing in the river during Tammuz evenings, I was thinking about the Jordan water in our Eretz Israel. Oh, if we had but merited Luamdala Nuhazchut, says the Hebrew. And here is the Jordan at our feet. Yes, my mother, the wind is upon me, waves rolling and light touching. Is it evening, my son? Evening tide, mother, stars and moon upon us. Upon you too, stars and moon, my son. Yes, mother. Pick me up in your arms. Now we get the instruction. Okay, remember, we are to build a character. We are to become something. And we are learning from our victim mothers and fathers back there. Pick me up in your arms, my son. Take me away from the water, my son. Like this. Lay me down in the grass, my son. Dew is falling nearby and it's warm. Like tears, my son. Warm like tears, mother. Let me feel your body, my son. And now comes the moment. She's touching in his imagination his dress. Your claw, clothes are coarse, woven fabric. My son, soldiers wear. A rifle on your shoulder. Hooray to you, my son. Until we arrive to Jerusalem, my son. Yes, mother. And when we get to Jerusalem, son, my son, the royal temple, city of kings, oh, not even on Shabbat will you change these clothes, my son. Wow. Traditional woman from back there, fathoming, imagining, going to the temple, and she will not have her son dress up properly for the event? No because this is the different, the new way of the land, Derch Eretz. These clothes, my son, 
Once I wanted to see you dress in silk. I do not want that anymore, as you say, mother. And always with a rifle, my son. Amen, mother. And even when the Goel, the Savior, comes and people will beat their swords into plowshares and they will throw their guns into the fire, not you. No, my son, not you. No, mother. In case the Goim rise again and the mass iron, should they rise once more and we shall not be ready as we were not ready till now. Here is the lesson. Here is how this really prophetic, very influential, poetic voice of Israel of 1949. I have it for you from my mother that we will never let down our guns. Never again shall we be caught unprepared. Never again not ready and not in uniform. One voice, a strong voice. You can hear it still reverberating in the Israeli society. How dare you not be ready? How dare you let go? Have they not all stood aside and let we happen when we were helpless? Never again shall we be helpless. This is one of the strongest, not the only one. Call for never letting go. The Holocaust, our dearest sacrifice there at the Belzets altar, as he calls it, are sending the message through this prophetic voice of Oritz V. Grimberg to the young state of Israel. Beware, be ready. Okay? Yana. And now, as I promised you, we come to the students. By the way, those of you who are fluent in Hebrew, I really implore you, look at the Hebrew if you have a moment and suggest better translation if you think it's needed. And now, turn your pages to Gilnativ, my favorite here. So Gilnativ is a reform rabbi who lives in Carmiel. He just finished his tenure at the reform congregation in Carmiel and retired. I could put the day of his age, although it's not on, he's not on Wikipedia, because we happened to go to school together. So I know exactly how old he is. And I know him since high school. And we have ups and downs, and he's, he normally studies at Hartman with the rabbinical group, but this year his daughter needs to finish a PhD dissertation, so he and his wife are traveling to be with the grandchildren so the daughter can do what she needs to do. Been there, done it. Okay. And this is a poem he writes much later. He was a paratrooper. He belongs to the paratroopers who have liberated the old city and who reached the Kotel, etc. this message of Harabait Beyadenu, you know, and you can see his picture on the left-hand side from that time, and then you can see his picture of today. And the poem is not that old, it's about 15, 20 years old. So it's a poem written really retrospectively, and remember, as I suggested, the student-teacher relationship with Oritz V. Greenberg? So look how he echoes. Now, honestly, I haven't spoken to Gil yet about it. I was planning this weekend, but you know, stuff happened and I needed to become Gidon Sar. But I was going to ask him if he actually, like me, <coughs> never read Oritz V. Greenberg, or whether he did. So I'll find out and let you know if you're curious. I was not there. My memories are black and white pictures black and white books and diaries. The closest I got was when I touched the number carved into the arm of a wrinkled man. One day in June, 7th actually, 1967 in case you need to know, one day in June, they were all with me in a smoke-clouded alley leading up to the Lion's Gate. A million skinny burnt arms were pushing me voicelessly. They commanded, 
never let go of your gun. Now, Gil is as reform liberal left wing as they come. I know him, have known him most of my adult life. This is not contradictory. This is something that is seeped deep into us from those lessons from back there. And whether he did read Ulrich V. Grimberg or not, the message got across. You are running in the smoky, narrow alley towards the wall, and they are pushing you with their skinny heads and arms, OK? And the commandment is there, like the mother, not you, my son. You'll keep the rifle. You'll keep the gun. OK? Ready? Any quick comment, need, question, clarification before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Um, this fourth line in the Hebrew, it's not in the English version. I wonder if that's one Which line? And some people know it's not in the right. Like, in the English, it's not in the English. Oh, my mistake. I'll correct it. Thank you. Thank you. No, my mistake. I skipped it. Sorry. Yes. In, in more specifically in the Greek word, but also in this one, it seems to be an abandonment of faith in God. In other words, when he says, even if the Savior comes, we're keeping our guns. That's intentional on both sides? I think so. The law el that we have seen in the first one, it totally comes from there, from the need to have the list for the little baby carriages without the babies. Then we need help, you go to law el. Totally always there underneath. Scratch Holocaust literature a little bit, and you will find the absence of God, or you will be faced by it. Now I need to tell you a story, and I hope you'll go with me. So here is Nathan Alterman, and the year is 1951, when Israel will establish on its calendar a day of commemoration for the Holocaust. Not yet by law, that will come in 59, but it doesn't matter, it's not that lecture, that's another lecture. But I wanted you through the print on the name to see the name. Holocaust and Ghetto Fighters Memorial Day. And when it gets finalized by law later, it will be Holocaust and Heroism Memorial Day and it should be 59. Okay, the first one is 51, the second is 59. Alterman goes in between. So from the early phases of the lessons learned and taught in this country, to my generation, and I will say unfortunately to following generations, there was a clear separation and the need for separation between those who fought back the few, and those who quote, unquote, and double quote, unquote, went like sheep to the slaughter. It's not my expression. It's a critical, judgmental expression. But this is how Israel commemorized the Holocaust for many years, actually by name still today. The name of the day is Yom HaShoah VeHagvara. The fact that your rabbi from the pulpit is saying Yom HaShoah, it's because they are smart, and they know that they cannot tell you the full name, like Yom HaZikaron L'Shoah V'Lagvorah, what rabbi will say that from the pulpit. But the full name is that, the separation between the heroic fighters and the rest. The year is now 1954, and Alterman is writing a poem that you will find on your next page. I think it will be page eight, because it's my nine, so it must be your eight. And he's calling it the day of commemoration and the rebels. The rebels, the uprising. And Alterman is very concerned because of this separation. And Alterman has his weekly segment in the paper called the seventh column, different lecture, in which he reacts to events of the day. Now, all those of you 
who have done silver platter with me in a temple that will not be named right now somewhere around Boston. I'm calling upon you to pay attention as Alterman is referencing his own poem in a critical way because he doesn't like the separation. He thinks that it's not for us to tell them apart. We need to remember them. And Alterman, like Alterman, will take upon him the chutzpah to speak in the name of the victims. Thank you, Eli. So here is the day. Alterman has watched the ceremonies, and he doesn't like it. Comes Friday, seventh column, and he writes the following. And on the day of remembrance, the fighters and rebels have said, do not place us apart from the exile, Hagula, under shining lights. Alterman is speaking in the name of the ghetto fighters and the partisans and the heroes. And he's saying to the Israeli audience, to the ceremony makers, to the ritual makers, to the teachers who taught us how we all needed to be like Mordechai and Ilevich and Chana Senesh. And he says, no way. Those very uprising people, they wouldn't want it. And they would say to us had they lived, do not put us apart from the rest of our people in shining lights. At the hour of commemoration, we step down of the pedestal to mingle again in the, in the darkness with the chronicles of the masses of the house of Israel, Beth Israel. We don't need that separation. It's not the story of the time. You don't get it here in Israel. Pay attention, it's a different story. The fighters and the rebels have said, the day of witnessing, its main and true image is not barricaded strongholds of flame. Neither is it the image of a young man and a girl who came out to assault or die. Any recollection? A young man and the girls coming out from darkness to face the nation. Alterman is referencing his own silver platter, where he created the image of the fighting youth of Israel here with a young man and a woman. And he says, it's not that image. It's not that story. It's not that chapter. Don't make that equation. Be sensitive. Try to understand. Such as in the classical images of world revolts eternally burning. No, this is not the source of the period. Do not crown it with battle flags to see only in them its essence, its redemptions and justification. The fighters and rebels have said we are part of many people, part of its honor and bravery and its stifled deep weeping. We are part of a time with no brother, a time that rejects the monotony of high phrases, nor does it stand open-faced among common symbols. Those who fell with their arms in their hands perhaps will not accept the mechitza. Alterman, your secular Alterman, it says, we Jews have created a mechitza between victims and victims, honoring the fighters, putting down the others. The fighters wouldn't let us. They don't want this mechitza. It shouldn't be there between them and their dying communities all the way to some leaders and dealers. <coughs> it's the Judenrat. It's the people who dealt with the Nazis, like Kassner, who is in tri on trial at these times. Don't judge them. What do you understand? We who have seen the time in its scariest and darkest, 
we who have seen its bravery with so many faces never seen before. We are the lightning that cuts through its sky, but we shall not rise in its midst as a mass statue of a smattering who hold the greatness of the period soul, for it is stamped by the battle seal. Therefore, we the fighters and the uprisers say, the essence of this day is not just that which is highlighted by speeches and writings by our brothers. The word, the battle, and the barricade, there is nothing to match them. Yet they are not the only symbol of this memorial day. Not in them does it reside. The dignity of the nation should not seek its only sublime justification by the saying apologetically, I have fought, I have raised the flag of rebellion, the uprising just one note in this whole story. It was not the heart and the goal. When Alterman is saying that in 1954, nobody is ready to listen. Nobody. He's ostracized. How dare you? Here is a clipping by Moshe Carmel from La Merchav. And here is what he said. Will you, ma'am, read it again? As long as our voice is heard in this country, we shall raise our words against the obscuring of the difference between the two roads, the one faithful to the end and the struggle on one side, and the one of surrender, abandoning and turning in on the other. We shall oppose the simplification that sees just straight lines of black and white. Having said that, we shall rise against the attempt to, to destroy the barrier that separates between purity and defilement, between heroism and cowardice, between loyalty and betrayal. Moshe Carmel, a member of the Knesset. Alterman is thoroughly from all over, right, left, and center of the political Israeli continuum in 1954. They are yelling at him, on the street even, personally. How dare you? The holy of holiest is for us to admire the fighters and to be critical of those who went like sheep to the slaughter. This is Israel of those years. This is my generation's education in school. I start school in 52. This is how the ceremonies go. I remember them. I was part of them. Unfortunately, my children were exposed to the same. It is starting to change by my grandchildren. However, changes are slow. And the first one will occur in a very interesting way. The year is 1961. Does it ring a bell? Eichmann trial, OK? So we are seven years after this, seven whole years. And we go to the Eichmann trial. And here is Chaim Gori, who had just passed away, the last of his generation of the poets of the Palmach period, etc. And Chaim Gori, for the same paper from Moshe Carmel, the one who criticized, Chaim Gori too had criticized in the same paper. I have a clip by him, but you know, some people watch that I do not teach again that which I have taught. And I have used that clip in another session, so I looked for another one for this one. And Chaim Gori is sitting at the trial, having to write daily reports to the same paper, La Melchav. It's not the Var, neither Herod. Israel always had many dailies. And go to your page 10. The book is called Facing the Glass Booth. You have it in English. It's available. It's Chaim Guri's The Palmachnik. You know your classical Sabra, the one who wrote all those songs, Babelwad and whatever, that we sing on Memorial Day for the soldiers. You cannot be more Sabra and more Israeli than Chaim Guri. Because Alterman, you know, he was born in Warsaw. So there is a touch of diaspora in him. But Guri is like 100%, OK? Sits at the trial. Now, before we start, I need to teach you one Hebrew word. Actually, it's an acronym. It's Nachal. Had it not been an acronym, he would be a river. 
but with an acronym is Noar Chalutzi Lochem, Pioneering Fighting Youth. It's a unit in the military, okay? How shall I tell you, because we Israelis, we can, you know, divide on anything, like Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Datim, Chilonim, whatever. We can also divide according to the military units we have served in, and everybody knows that the Nachal is better or worse than the paratroopers, depending on where your children have been. So enough said, both my kids went through the Nachal. So you get where I'm standing on this one. However, Yossi was in the paratroopers, so what can I tell you? You know, major dilemmas and issues. And now we are back to 1961, and Guri, the ultimate Sabra, is sitting there listening to a survivor bearing witness. And he writes, and they had given me boiling water and the rag and told me to scrub the sidewalk by the Metropole Hotel. The bucket was partly filled with acid. My hands bloated soon enough. They had brought out the rabbi, the chief rabbi, Dr. Teiglich, 70 years old. He too, like me, was ordered to wash the sidewalk. He did this while covered with his talis, his prayer shawl. While he was lying on the ground, the guard had asked me, him, how do you like this? The rabbi responded, if God likes it, I'm his servant. For an Israeli, chiloni, secular, talmachnik, you know. I'm writing these words down as Morris Fleischmann, one of the former dignitaries of the Jewish community of Vienna, is speaking. I do not want to see him. I do not want to hear him. I would rather be at the Nachal parade today in the stadium, seeing strong, beautiful people put with an, but with an unimaginable strength. Morris Fleischmann is holding me by my collar as if he's saying, sit here to the end. The shortest of the guards was five foot eight. He says, making me aware of how short he is. These two are your own flesh and blood, I am telling myself. They are at the position to demand that you sit to the, to this, to the, through this. You are not running away from here. You are not escaping to the Nachal. 1961, Chaim Gori. So sometimes in history, you can put your finger on the day a change is starting to occur. It will take years for Guri and others to come around and agree not to be judgmental of Holocaust survivors. I need to explain that I am a daughter of two survivors who did not fight in the partisans or the ghetto, and were not parachutists like Chana Senesh. So I grew up to be the child of the sheep to the slaughter. And therefore, these transitions in Israeli society have a very deep meaning for me. Actually, I had the privilege of speaking to Chaim Gori about it. Much, much, much later in life, about 20 years ago. Okay. I want to take you, because you remember we are looking, there are two more pages of this, which you're more than welcome to read, but I need to look at the watch. So I'm asking you to go to the next one, and I need for you now to raise your eyes, because the event, when this poem was read in a ritual of Yom HaShoah for the first time, was at a location that may look familiar to you. Okay, and I knew when and how it was composed, and I really went to some trouble to find this picture, because uh, Michal Govrin is one of the poets, writers, educators, who were working very hard in the last recent years to create different Yom HaShoah ceremonies and to provide different texts. So you are looking on your page 12, I assume, at who 
or in Hebrew, which is beautiful, because how do you say who in Hebrew? It says me, okay? Me, which could be also me. Who, he who had kept his humanity even when turned into dust. A father who had sent his daughter to life. A mother who had sent her son. A granddaughter who had fought for her grandmother's life. A man who had held the hand of a stranger. Who are the women and the men who held a gun and inscribed the lines of freedom in Chronicles? And he who had kept up his forbidden commandment was to fill in. And she who distributed forged papers. And he who smuggled borders. He who wrote the paint and painted and told stories and dreamt and photographed and documented human testimonies. He who laughed and loved. She who wrote down recipes, there is a mistake there, to make the hunger go away. Those who shared a slice of bread. He who held up the one who fell in the parade. She who finished the slavery quarter for her neighbor. My mom did that. She was a seamstress before. And in the workshop, there were others who pretended to be seamstresses and couldn't finish the quota. And suddenly, you know, like, this is like from two years ago. And this, suddenly, my mother gets justified, legitimized, as heroic as the fighters. You know, I'm 72, it took some time. And she's gone for eight years already. Okay. She who finished the slavery quota of her neighbor. Those who said a word of encouragement. And those who at twilight, in the shade of the crematorium, stood up praying or singing. Look at the inclusion of the two very Jewish expression of ritual, the prayer and the sing-along of the youth movements, etc. Who are those children who played and dreamt and wrote their poems between fences? And he whose hand never left theirs, even when they went to their death. Who are those men, women, child, and old men who sanctifies the human image? And look at the word tselim, tselim adam, tselim elohim, okay? So you can see the shift from the days of Oritz V. Grimberg was one clear message. For Alterman, as early in 54, looking at the messages we are sending and suggesting a different reading, not to be listened to for many years. For Guri picking up from Alterman and carrying the torch on all the way to this room two years ago. Okay? We are moving in this path of building a nation, building character. It's not monolithic. It's dynamic. It's changing. We are going to leave the chapter of learning from Auschwitz, and we are going to move to the next one. And that is learning from Sinai, learning from Tanakh. And we still have 20 minutes, so we'll do whatever we can. You know, it's the first time this session is given. I could not time it properly, so we'll do whatever. Quick comment, question, clarification before I move on. Yala, let's go. So, messages from Sinai, and here we are back with Amichai. We started with Amichai, the need to be strong and to be suntan. And now, skip page 14 and go to the next one, and then we'll come back. I promise you. Avi haya Elohim. Wow, Amichai. Amichai will sort of frame our understanding of the messages from Sinai and how he thinks at his late age. This is two from Open Shut Open, 1995, a late Amichai. And in Amichai's poetry, there is always the mother's voice and the father's voice. And the father's voice is always Torah, and the mother's voice is namely, in most cases, your practical chesed Judaism of doing stuff, of helping stuff, and so on. I'd like you to note how we started 
with Orisvi Greenberg carrying his mother's body, because when we end this poem, we will see Amichai taking leave of his dying father. So we are sort of framed in between the two. My father was God, and I didn't know it. He gave me the Ten Commandments, not in thunder and not in anger, not in fire and not in cloud, but gently. So first of all, the sheer chuspa of going to the most holy of holy texts of the Torah, the Ten Commandments. And Amicha is facing it with a series of negations. And he's inviting us through his father to feel free with Torah and to listen to alternative voices and different tones. It doesn't have to be the same tone all the time, you know, he says. My father, for example, he did it like this, not like this, not like this, not like this. It's almost like a description of God who doesn't have an image and doesn't have a form and doesn't have. So my father, he did not this, not this, not this. He did something else. Gently and with love. He added caresses and tender words. Would you and please and chanted remember and keep Shamor Zachor. Okay, it's the Shabbos. He chanted it, Shamor Zachor, with the same tune and pleaded and wept quietly between one commandment and the next. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord in vain. Shall not take, not in vain. Please do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Okay? And he hugged me tight and whispered in my ear, Thou shalt not steal, shall not commit adultery, shall not kill. And he lay the palm of his white open hands on my head with the Yom Kippur blessing, honor, love, that thy days may be long upon this earth. And the voice of my father, white as his hair, then he turned his face to me one last time as on the day he died in my arms and said, I would like to add two more commandments. You know, did any of your dying parents ever said that to you? Well, Amichai was lucky, you see. Because on his deathbed, his father told him, you know what, I forgot. I didn't have time to deal with that throughout my life. But now that it's, it's finishing, I really have something very urgent to do. I need to add two commandments. The 11th commandment, thou shall not change. And the twelfth commandment, thou shalt change, you will change. Thus spoke my father, and he turned and walked away and disappeared into his strange distances. Wow. What I need for you to take from this, as we are venturing into this last bit of our presentation today, of learning how to be that which you need to be, character building, etc., what Amichai is sharing with us is not just learning from Sinai. It's the ease and liberty of going to the text with your father, with yourself, with your life experience, with the freedom to add, with the freedom to change, with the freedom to include the personal tone and the music and the weeping and the laughter why don't just add please to the commandments, you know? Could it be that harmful? Will you just do this please? And this ease of Amichai that is so important in Israeli society is important for us as well. And now I'm taking you on an interesting venture. Look at this guy, Giora Fischer. Totally unknown poet. And I'm so fortunate to have found him. It will come in English in a minute, and it's on your page 14. He was born in the year 1951, so he's barely younger than myself. He's 60-something. And oftentimes, when you study and teach literature, there is the big debate between the purists of the text study 
who will tell you, you should never add stuff from the outside. It doesn't matter where he lived and who his wife was and what he voted, or whether there was a war around. And then there'll be the others, like myself, who will tell you that the context is extremely important. So I will persuade you to do that. We will read this without telling you the context, and then we will read it after I have told you the context of when this is written. It is possible, if shall, that you can. In the drawer that was not opened for many years, I found on a page colored with crayons, Cain and Abel. To the teacher's question, what did you learn from this story? The kid at the picture margins answered, it is possible to kill even those we love. So the kid who did that drawing with crayons left in a drawer to be opened many years later was doing it as a school assignment. And next to the drawing, there was a teacher's question, what did you learn from that? And the kid like Amichai is totally taken off from the Cain and Abel story because his learning is that it may happen that you will kill that you love. So far for no context. And now the context. Your Fisher was writing in his young age and then stopped for many years and went back to it after his son got killed in one of the IDF fighting in battles against terrorists in Jenin in 2002. And it's through the process of mourning and looking at his son's stuff and opening drawers that haven't been opened for many years. He can reach out to the child that had left him. But when a father reads that in his son's learning from the Cain and Abel, you can kill that which you love even, doesn't it throw you back in the Israeli reality to the classical Akedah imagery? Fathers who love their sons dearly in this country will encourage them to do that which is needed to be done. So the story of the Akedah, this is a sculpture in the main square in Tel Aviv, facing the Tel Aviv Museum, and you can see the Ayil, and you can see the headless Yitzchak, etc. And we will be looking probably at one poem, or the rest you are on your own. So go to page 16 for me for a classical. Here is Chaim Guri. We are reading a poem from an anthology not available in English called in Hebrew, Lanetzach Anagnech, I Shall Sing You Forever. It's an anthology published 14 years ago in 2004, collecting all Israeli poems based on biblical stories. And I spoke to the editor, Milka Shaked, and I asked her, how did you decide where to start collecting from? She said, very simple, when the earlier anthology ended, okay? And I think it's soon time for us to have a new one. Smack on the cover of the anthology of biblical messages related modern Israeli poetry, is a quote that you can see. If you couldn't see, I'll put a circle around it. And since not all of you are yet fluent in Hebrew, I'll give you a translation. They are born with a knife in their heart, and now you can go to heritage to Yerusha, composed in the 50s. And you can understand that if Milka Shaked is putting it on the cover page of her anthology, that ought to tell you something about the position of this poem in modern Israeli text. I mean, it's as close to an iconic text that you could come in modern Israeli poetry. So first of all, note Chaim Guri <coughs> and his entry point to the Akedah. Because normally when we read the Akedah 
So God told Abraham, take your son. Well, I have more than one, the only one. <coughs> Each one is only to his mother. And then that which you love, you I love them both. And finally, Israel. And then they settle up, and then they travel for three days, and then they reach, and then they, Abraham says to the servants to stay, and he tells them, we will go and we will come back, when that was not the intention, okay? And then they schlep all the way up, and then comes the moment, tying, and then the denouement, the end. And Guri doesn't care about the whole story. He's not there when Abraham hears the voice. He's not there during the three days. He's not on the climbing to the Moriah. Nothing. He's only interested in the moment the ram came last. So my reading and my suggestion to you would be that from the first words of this poem, Chaim Guri is telling us Akedah's story did not end when the ram came. It only starts then, our story. The ram came last, and Abraham did not know that he came in answer to the boy's request, his first thanks at the time of the winning day. Will you allow me to suggest that modern Israeli poetry can be read as a modern midrash? And modern Midrash, and Midrash often goes in between the lines and adds that which is missing. And now Gori is telling you, I know that as they were climbing, Yitzhak was having a conversation with God. He was praying, don't let him do it, don't let him do it, don't let him do it. Because he says, I know that the Abraham did not know, but I, Gori, know that the ram came as an answer to the boy's request. There was an inner secret conversation over the head of Abraham between Yitzhak and God. I know that. The old man raised his head in Hebrew, Rosho Hasav, his white head, when he saw that he was not dreaming and the angel stood with the knife falling from its hand. This is the moment of what is lost in translation. How do you say knife in Hebrew? No. When you have dinner, how do you say knife? Sakin. English has knife for this and knife for that. Hebrew has another word. You're right, sir. Ma'achelet. How often do you see this, that word in text? When you know, see the word ma'achelet, you know that it's akedah. And the Hebrew can do that. And the Hebrew says, nashra ha-ma'achelet miyado. The, the, the ma'achelet fell from his hand. And the verb is amazing because it's not he put it down. It's not it fell. It's like a nature's act, like leaves when they drop of the tree comes fall, Nushrim, you cannot control that movement. You know what else, Nushir? Your hair. You cannot control that either. It's nature. And Guri is using that verb. Abraham did not intentionally let go of the machelet. It just fell, finishing. Ah. Ah, Yofi. I don't know if it's Yofi for you. <laughs> the child, freed of his bonds, saw his father's back. Yitzchak, it is said, was not offered as a sacrifice. Look at the tone. Chaim Guri is stepping off from the scene and is now talking to us directly. You know, we read that thing that he was not sacrificed. He was not offered as a sacrifice. He lived a very long time seeing the good until the light of his eyes dimmed. So here are two images. Yitzchak looking at his father's back, 
clear suggestion. I don't know what happened in that family after this, whether they could face each other. Clear message there. And then Yitzhak had a good life, it is said. Or can you have a good life after this trauma until you become blind? And now comes the message, the Israeli one. But he bequeathed that hour to his descendants. They were born with a knife in their heart. Oi. Israel of the early 50s. What did our poetry teachers use to us? So what did the poet mean when? So I know because I asked him. And here is the story. About 20 years ago, I was busy doing distance learning for the Jewish Agency. And I was teaching, believe it or not, a group of Israeli poetry students in Warsaw, Poland, through the technology. Now, I don't speak Polish. Had it been Budapest, I could have taught them in Hungarian, but this was Poland. So they have an interpreter, Magda, and I'm sending her the text ahead of time, and she translates. I'm sending Hebrew and English to make it easier for her, and then I say a few sentences, Magda goes, then they, uh, it's terrible. But we study. And this is the week between Yom HaShoah and Yom HaTzma'ut, so I figure a classic, okay? I will teach that. We go through the poem, Magda Me, Magda Me. In the group, they are very polite. They are Europeans. They wait patiently. And there is in the group a woman called Anya. I know her because she is a Hebrew teacher. And she came for professional development there where I worked in the Jewish agency. And she's fluent in Hebrew. And yet, politely, she will ask the question in Polish from Magda. And Magda will translate, and I will answer in Hebrew. I reach this line, and I say the following. The end. They are born with a machelet in their heart. It is customary in Israel to read this as an ideological, maybe even a political statement, about how generation after generation of Jews, at least in this country, are born with the promise of the machelet in their heart, and they will need to be sacrificed. Anya cannot hold back. She starts yelling in Hebrew. No Magda, no translation, no nothing. You Israelis, every single thing has to be about you. Can you not see that this is a universal poem? It's a, as much about us and it's about you. Okay, so my lesson went, you know, havoc. It doesn't work anymore and somehow I finish it, doesn't matter. I go home, I try thinking about it, it was late at night. Next morning, you'll have to believe me because nobody can invent the story like that. I had a meeting with Yael Gur. Yael Gur is the daughter of Chaim Guri, and she is a liter literature teacher, and we work together on a project. And she comes in with all her papers and stuff, and she wants to start work. I said, hold on, Yael. This is what happened last night. So she smiles. So I said, Yael, why are you smiling? I said, because I read this poem like you, like an ideological statement of our, our condition in Israel. And Abba says that the poet did not mean it. Well, Abba, you know, is the poet. So Abba says that the poet didn't mean it. Fine. So suddenly I have a brainstorm. I said, Yael, will your father come next week and teach the class in Warsaw? Magda and stuff. He said, I don't know. But next day, I get an email. Abba said yes, like three words. Abba Amar came. Okay. Wow. I write to Poland, a whole to-do. The Israeli ambassador shows up. The head of the, Pol the secretary of the Polish Association of Poets and Writers came with a bouquet of flowers <laughs> to give to the television, whatever. <laughs> and Guri comes in. And the first thing he did was to ask Magda, will you read my poem to me in Polish? And she did. And then they asked him the question. And he said, listen, I wrote this in the early 50s. It wasn't the Israel that you know now. 
with the War of Independence and the War of Sinai and the Six Day War and the Attrition War and Yom Kippur and Lebanon one and two and three and Gaza one, you know, it's not what we were hoping for. It's not the future we saw. Later it's acquired that meaning. I cannot honestly say that I meant it. I'm not sure what I meant. But then he added, and he did this movement. He said, once a poet lets a poem fly, it's not his anymore. It's yours. And he turned, Yael was there, of course, and me. We were sitting on both his sides. Like he died at 90-something two, two or three months ago. So he was then already well over 70. So it was an honor to sit by him, etc. So he looked at the two of us, the literature teachers, the mavens, and he say, you read into it whatever you want and let your audiences and students read whatever they can. But this is a milestone in the education and future Israelis, in a reference to parents who need to know that. And look at the connection between this and the Giora Fisher poem about Cain and Abel discovering that you can kill that which you love. Suddenly you have a midrashic connection between Cain and Hevel and the Akedah, which I must admit I never thought about. Now, how well can you do for another few minutes? Because I'm good to go. Okay, whoever, let's make it, you know, the Israeli honest way. Whoever needs to leave, go. And I'm not insulted, I'm fine. I got my time with you. I call this particular chapter the convoluted message of the Akedah. Because this is 50s. And we are back to the Amichai last book that we have been going back to almost every single phase of this class. It's a small book, by the way. Very small one, the open, shut, open. But so rich and so big. And there, in that book, Amichai has, I think, three or four different Akedah-related poems. And here is a beautiful one to almost conclude our session, because I'll try to do a very quick one at the end. You know how Israelis like to hike? And we go on hikes with school and families and whatever. And how we especially like to hike at places where there have been battles, either biblical or modern history or whatever. So Amichai, being the product of that culture, wanting to do tiyulim with his family, is now thinking about Avraham. And rather than saying, I am like Avraham, which is a proper order of things, he says the following. The poem is called Every Year because Amichai, I told you my older students, older not because you're old, but just because we have been at it for a while, that Amichai has amazingly creative poems and the dullest or non-existent titles for his poems. So <laughs> what normally happens is that we use the first line because he left the poem with no title. Uh, okay. So every year, our father Avraham takes his son to Mount Moriah the same way that I take my children to the Negev Hills where my war took place. So here is what I thought you may enjoy. Here is the Negev Hills with the battles of Amichai, and this is a famous drawing of the going up to the Akedah, the Tiyul. But note how Amichai is saying not, I do like Abraham. But I figure out that if I do it, Abraham must have done it before me, right? Because this is Jewish tradition. So I go on Tiyul, probably they have gone on Tiyulim as well. So Abraham did with his sons what I do with my sons. Abraham walks with his sons. This is where I left the servants. That's where I tied the ass to the tree at the foot of the hill. And here, Right at this spot, you ask me, it's Ark, my son. Here's the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for sacrifice? So note what in Amichai's mind, Avraham is remembering. 
Here is where we left the servants. Here is where I tied. Here is where you asked. A little further up, you asked me again. When they reached the top of the mountain, they rested a while and ate, of course, and drank. And he showed them the thicket where the ram was caught by its horns. So this was the purpose of the tiyul. I needed to show you where the cavalry arrived, you know? And the great denouement of the story, the ram came. And when Abraham died, Yitzchak took his sons to the same spot. Here I lifted up the wood, and that's where I stopped for a breath. This is where I asked my father, and he replied, God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. And that's where I knew that it was me. Huh. A totally different recollection of the story. Yitzchak does not remember the ram. He remembers the moment when he got it, when he understood. So Amichai is suggesting, you know, there may be different readings of the story. Sort of talking to Guri, maybe. Different memories. And when Yitzchak became blind, his sons brought him to that same mountain, Mount Moriah, and described him in words all those things that he may have already forgotten. So here is Amichai sending us on our way of dealing with text, very different than one he suggested in My Father Was God, the one of accepting transformation, the one of accepting different messages, but also a very nice, for me, hint to the topic of your seminar this year, because this is literally Derech Eretz. They are doing the Tiyul. They are walking the land in the roads of the land, and it's in the Tiyul, in the road, during the Derech of the Eretz, the walking of the land, that they will get their lessons. And last but not least, and then I totally let you go. Will people from Temple Emmanuel excuse me if I taught a poem that I once taught in your temple from the podium? It's not so bad in Jewish studies to look at the text twice, you know? We have done that. I'm taking you to your last poem and a very big favorite of mine. Yudit Kesari, born in the year 1935, still with us. Totally kibbutznik. Hashomer Tzair Kibbutz, as left as they come, and yet, fluency in biblical text has nothing to do with your level of observance, because she knows the text, and she goes to that same moment. And just look at the translation, because the Hebrew says Bereshit, which could be translated either as in the beginning, or as Genesis. Because the word carries the two meanings. In Hebrew, you don't need to waver. The English translation needed to make a choice in the beginning. Through our dim beginnings, the story trickles down. A father, his son, and the machelit. I know the English says knife, but I will say man. Chavirim. Now she decided, unlike David Hartman, our formative moment is not Sinai. Our formative moment is the Akedah. This is what trickles down. A father, a son, the Ma'achelet. How did it happen? And where was Sarai? Look at how she dresses her as Sarai because before she becomes the dignified Sarah with the hay at the end. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I'm not going to call you by this dignified name. Back to your origin, woman, womb, Sarai. How could you let it happen? How could she trust such a tyrannical God who would defend at the last moment? Why did she not cry out earlier when he had just saddled the donkey and loaded the woods? Do not raise your hand to the lad. Look at what you did, Kafra is doing. That which the angel had said, 
stopping the Akedah. She is calling upon Israeli women to do. Don't trust the man in our society. Don't let it happen. Stand on the road with your body and stop it from happening. Why did she not stop him midway, whispering through clenched lips, you will not pass this way? This is a beauty. Because you did Kafri, you need to trust me. Was raised in Hashomer Sa'ir, which is left, left of center, in a kibbutz of the 40s, when they admired the civil war in Spain. They were volunteers who went to fight against the Franco fascist regime. And the song of the fighters was about the fascist Non Pasaram, they will not pass. And for her, biblical lore and the youth movement lore are equally important. So she lets Sarah say, do not touch, like the angel. She lets Sarah sing non pasaram, like the two sources of her value systems. She wants Sarah to be both the biblical protecting mother and that woman who knows what you need to fight and what not. You will not pass this way as long as I'm alive, not this child the one we have waited for a hundred years, not the child of our soul, and the Hebrew translation allows two ways, the child of our soul, benefshenu, or the child who is the core of our being. I'd like to conclude with the following. Israeli culture, Israeli way of education, Israeli way of building character as society, oftentimes relies on biblical lore, which is masculine which is rock-like. We do not hear Sarah in the Akedah. We hear Sarah in the Midrash, which is already diasporic, which is or not the harsh rocks of this land of the Tanakh stories. Could you, did Kafri, be imploring our society to listen to the softer, more accommodating, midrashic, diasporic voice. I, for one, for sure agree. Thank you very much.